Uh, today we're still in the book of Judges. And today I want to talk about getting out of your wimpy rut. I know, some of you have uh, read the diary of a wimpy kid, right? Uh, or some of you have seen the movie. And a wimp is somebody who's cowardly. Uh, he's the opposite of a bully. A bully is the guy that, uh, you know, pushes people around. The wimp is the guy who gets pushed around. So we take Area 51 down to uh, uh, Cedar Point. And I got all these kids. And I say, who will ride the Millennium with me? Now, the Millennium is a big, huge, it's the tallest, I think, the tallest roller coaster there. And the kids that don't, I call them, oh, you wimp. <laughs> and so we get in the back of the park, and they got this ride called the ripcord. You know what the ripcord is? <laughs> you get in this jacket, and there's a cable that goes up much higher than the ceiling here. And then there's, they hook up another cable to you, and it pulls you back way up in the air. And the only way you come down is you've got a cord, and you've got to rip it. And then you just come swinging down. And so the kids say to me, hey, pastor, how about doing the ripcord? And I say, no way. And they say, wimp. <laughs> right? <laughs> wimp. There's a wimpy streak in all of us. There really is. There's a wimpy streak in all of us. I just have to prod around quite a bit to find out where that wimpy streak is. Uh, there's a young man who's attracted to a young lady. I said, well, just go over and talk to her. Oh, no, I could never do that. Why? He's got this little wimpy streak in him that she might reject him, right? A little wimpy streak. The, 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 the wimpy streak is just about everywhere. I said, well, why don't you uh, share your faith with your next-door neighbor? Oh, my goodness, I could never do that. How come you don't pray in public? You know, when you, at lunch, have food, you do that at home. Why, why can't you do that in public? Oh, I could never do that. We all tend to have, in, in some place in our life, a little wimpy streak. And today I want to talk about getting out of the wimpy rut. And to do so, I want to do so with a character in the Bible. And the ladies have been studying him for six weeks. A guy by the name of Gideon. And Gideon, he's a wimp. He's a wimp. We're a lot like Gideon. Gideon is a lot like us. He's kind of a spiritual wimp. And I want to just jump right into the context here, what's going on. A little background here. We get at chapter 6 of Judges, and it says this. Again, Israel did evil. Oh, here we go. Remember, we've been going around and around, right? This is the book of Judges. It goes around and around. Uh, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites, their enemy. Because of the power of Midian was so oppressive, they outnumber the Israelites, and they sweep into their land, and they're oppressing them. The Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountains, in cliffs, in caves, in strongholds. They were hiding all right, here's the picture. The Midianites are the bullies, and the Israelites are the wimps. They're the wimps. They're the wimpy ones. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and other eastern people, oh, it's a unified front of their enemies. It says they camped on the land and they ruined the crops. It wasn't enough just to take the crops. Any crops that would be left behind when they went home, they ruined them. All the way to Gaza, they did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkey. They were treacherous. They were just downright treacherous, mean, hostile. The Midianites so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord. Here we are in our cycle. Serving God, fallen to sin, they're enslaved by their enemies, and they cry out to the Lord. And when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, you know what's coming next, don't you? Because we've been through this cycle. Uh, God sent a prophet. What? Wait. Hold it. Hold everything. 
I thought God sent a judge. Well, he's been going around and around and around. This time he sends a, ju- a prophet, not a judge. And the prophet preaches a message. That's what prophets do. The prophet preaches, preaches this message. The Lord is the God who brought you out of Egypt. He's the God that brought you out from underneath the oppression of your slavery there. He brought you through the Red Sea and he brought you into the land. He gave you this land. You conquered the land. He gave it to you. And he asked of you not to worship any of their gods, but to only serve him. And I just took the last line. He said, this is what the prophet said. You have not listened to me. God's given us his word. It's right there, his word. It's the Bible. I, as a prophet, should be standing here saying, you have not listened to the Lord. That's what, that's what he was doing. That's what the preacher was doing. You have not listened to the word of God. And now the word listen here is not that you didn't hear it because we're going to find out He knew the story, but it means more like you have not hearkened unto it. What you heard, you did not do. You did not do. That's what the prophet said. As we go on in the passage, I clicked it twice. The angel of the Lord actually did come. Now, the angel of the Lord is different from the prophet. There's the prophet. All of a sudden, suddenly in the text, it changes. From the prophet to the angel of the Lord. Now, if you know anything about the scriptures, you know that when it has a designation, the angel angel of the Lord. This is one very special individual. This is not an angel with wings on his back. It's actually a visible manifestation of God. Later in this passage, he's going to call him the Lord Jehovah. The angel of the Lord, the word angel just means messenger. And it's like it's saying that the Lord, he came as his own messenger. He came in a form and a fashion an appearance of something, in this case, a man. He comes and he appears, and the Lord is right there speaking. And this is the angel of the Lord came. And when this angel of the Lord came, he appeared to Gideon. And this is where we pick up where wimpiness is really exposed. He's hiding. He's hiding. Wimpiness shows up by... When the bully comes around, you run and you hide. You don't confront. You don't engage. You sheepishly sneak out. The angel of the Lord came, and he sat down under an oak tree in Ophrah. Not Oprah. That's the TV program, okay? In Ophrah, all right? And he sat down and the, under the tree that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite. Now, Joash is actually Gideon's father, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat. Now, I had to put a threshing floor up there. I want you to see what a threshing floor looks like. The threshing floor is where you would bring all of your, your grain that you've harvested uh, from your fields, and you'd put it on the, on the floor, and it was, it was a solid, flat area, usually of stone, and you'd take a threshing sled of, or some other instrument so that you would run it over it, you would thresh it, you would crush it, and then you would do, you take a fork, it's called a winnowing fork, and you would stick it in what you have just threshed. You throw it up in the air, and you only do this on a breezy day. The wind would catch the chaff, the husk of all the grain. It would catch it, and it would blow it away, and down would fall just the grain, what, that, what you're after. And it would fall down, they keep doing this, and then when you're all done, you'd have a pile of chaff on the side in all your grain, you'd gather all your grain up, and then you'd want to mill it so that you'd make flour out of it and all the rest. All right? So you want it to usually be up on a higher plateau. So when the wind blows, send your chaff away. But Gideon, he's taken in his harvest. He was actually threshing his wheat in the wine press. Now the wine press, I got a picture of an ancient wine press here. And archaeologists have dug this up this way. You would put your grapes in there, you'd stomp them, and then all the leaves would fall to the bottom, and then the juice would stay at the top. You'd pull the juice off the top, and then later you'd scoop out all the junk, all the gook, all right? And so he is inside the wine press, threshing 
breaking up all his, his wheat, his kernel. His, and later he's going to thresh it. He's going to throw it. After threshing, he's going to winnow it. He's going to throw it up. But because he's in a hole, he's got to really throw it up there. You see, he's making a lot of extra work for himself because he's hiding. He's hiding it to keep it from the Midianites because the bully's coming to take it away. The bully's coming to take it away. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, here's what the angel said. This is God. You've got to realize, this is God. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Here's Gideon. <laughs> He's in there stomping, breaking the grain. Whoa, who's here? What? Who? You're talking to me? Wait a minute. Mighty warrior? <laughs> I think you got the wrong guy. <laughs> I'm wimpy Gideon. <laughs> Don't you know who I am? The Lord is with you. Remember that. Mighty warrior. Fascinating term. It's, he's an ish kail gibor. That's the Hebrew. Man, mighty, strong. Whew. Man, mighty, strong. Translated mighty man of valor. It's the same term, isha kail gibor, that is used in Proverbs 31 for a woman. Only there they don't say a woman of valor. They call her a virtuous woman. Same terms. But when you speak of a woman, you call her virtuous. When you speak of a man, he's a man of valor. Here, mighty man of valor. Mighty warrior is the way this translation puts it. Mighty warrior. Well, who are you talking about? Not me. His wimpiness is exposed because he was hiding. It's also exposed because he begins questioning, wait a minute, what you just said, the Lord is with you. If the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Wait, where are all the wonders of our fathers uh, told us about? The prophet's been preaching about what he did in Egypt. I know what he's done. Ten plagues on Egypt, parting of the Red Sea, water coming out of a rock, manna being delivered from heaven. You know, and he goes on. He said, when they came into the land, we conquered Jericho. The walls fell down. Where are all the wonders of our fathers told us about? So he asks these two questions because he's really a doubter. A doubter about himself and a doubter about God. Is God really with me? You ever been there? God, where are you? Why is all this happening? Where are you when I need you? You're hiding. He's a doubter. He's a doubter. I find it very fascinating that the Lord doesn't answer those questions. Instead, the Lord turned to him and he said, Go in the strength you have. Do you realize you have more than enough right now? He says, Gideon, you already have the strength to do what you need to do. You have more than enough. That's kind of our theme there that we're talking about. And some people say, well, I, I don't have enough to give to the Lord. Yes, you do. You have more than enough already. If the Lord is asking of you to give 10% to the Lord, a tithe, okay, then he's already given you 10% more than you need because he would not ask you to give up what you don't need. He's already given that to you. You have more than enough already. You just need to surrender to him. Listen, he says, go in the strength you have. You already have strength to do what I want you to do. God never calls you to do something that he doesn't equip you to do. He doesn't. He never calls you to fail. He calls you to succeed. Calls you to succeed. He says, go in the strength that you have and save Israel. Rescue them. Now he's calling on Gideon to be the judge because the judge were the deliverers, they were the rescuers, they were the saviors. He said, I want you to save them out of the hands of the Midianites. Am I not sending you? This is so important. He hears the Lord telling him, go, I'm sending you. <laughs> but Lord Gideon asks, how can I save Israel? Who am I to talk to my next door neighbor? Who am I to fill out a pledge card? Who am I to pray in public place? <laughs> my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in the family. Listen, 
I'm the least spiritual person. How could God bless what I do? You see what I'm saying? Doubts. He doubts. He doubts. His own ability. God, you, you must have the wrong Gideon here. <laughs> You must mean the other Gideon, you know, the guy that's not afraid, and he's, he's actually out there in the open, threshing his... You got the wrong guy. His wimpiness is exposed, and the Lord answers, I will be with you. I want to tell you something really important. When God is with you, you are the majority. Boom. When God is with you, you're on the winning side. He said, I will be with you, and I will strike down the Midianites all together, all at once. I'm going I'm to wipe out the Midianites. Gideon replies, if now I have found favor, you see his wimpiness is being exposed, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. And I notice doubt has an extra E in it. Take that one out. <laughs> he doubts God's word at this point. He says, if now I found, well, God just told him he did. This book is the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. This, this is the word of God. I'm wimpy when I doubt this book and what it says. This is God speaking to me here he is. Uh, if now, you see what we don't, he confused with the mission with the message. The message is going. He said, Oh, if I have now found favor. Yeah, you have. God has appeared to you. God saved you. Yes, you have. So he, he's doubting what God has said. He says, Gideon says, Please do not go away till, until I come back and bring an offering set before you. He knows, well, just this, this, this individual here is uniquely different individual. And the Lord said to him, notice it, the Lord, not the angel anymore, the Lord. This is Jehovah, this is God, who's manifested himself in the presence of Gideon. And he said, I will wait until you return. God is so patient with us. Oh, my goodness. He is so patient with me. It, I, I don't understand it. Last night, I snapped at my wife just a little bit while we were watching TV. Ooh, I knew, I knew it as soon as I did it. <laughs> And I apologize as soon as I did it too. <laughs> but I said, you're interrupting what I'm watching on TV. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am so, huh? I said, you didn't do it that fast. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Truth hurts. Oh. <laughs> oh. The Lord is so patient with us. My wife was patient for my apology. <laughs> oh. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. So this is what happened. Gideon went prepared a young goat. He got an ephah flour and he made bread and he offered it to him under the oak tree. So he takes all the stuff he's prepared, takes it out and puts it on a rock under the oak tree. And when the tip of the staff that was in the hand of the angel of the Lord, he took the staff and he touched the meat and the bread and it says, when that happened, boom, all of a sudden a flame of fire came out of the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared, just vanished out of his sight. Boom, he's gone. <laughs> Gideon had said, where are all the wonders? Like, it's like, if that fire had been any closer, you'd been struck with a bolt of lightning, buddy. <laughs> you just had a wonder from God. And Gideon realized, oh, this was the angel of the Lord. It's kind of like the disciples spent all, those, all that time with Jesus, not till he was he resurrected did they, oh, this is what he was talking about the whole time. All of a sudden, it's, oh, Gideon says, whoa, I've just had a face-to-face -face encounter with God. He says, ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face-to-face. -face. Now he's really quivering. This is a wimp. You've got to realize, he's a wimp. Moses said, no one can see the face of God and live. He says, oh, I've seen the angel of the Lord. I'm a dead man. I'm, I'm a goner. I'm dead. And all of a sudden, he said, but the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. You're not going to die. Whew. 
So he builds an altar and names it Peace. And that's very same night. He moves from hiding to being exposed as a sneaker. He's sneaking. He's sneaking. The same night the Lord said to him, tear down your father's altar. It's time to alter the family altar. Get things right at home. There's an altar of the Baal. I got a, a, the, the, the image on the left is Baal. The image on the right is Ashtoreth, also known in the Canaanite culture as Anat. Ashtoreth and Anat. Uh, they're, they're gods. The, these are their little shrine gods. I couldn't find an actual altar to Baal, but they had altars, and so I put the image of him up there. And, and Asherah uh, was Baal's consort. It's a fertility, it's a fertility cult. And uh, so there's a lot of sexual involvement in this, this ancient religion. And God said, I have nothing to do with that. But here, Gideon's father has the town altar to Baal and has an Asherah pole. This one up here is out of stone, but they're really out of wood. And, and, and so he's got to set up. And the Lord says, go tear that down. And the instruction said, when you tear it down, he said, then I want you to rebuild and make an altar to the Lord. And then take the pole and cut it up and use it as wood and offer a offering on top of that. So Gideon took 10 servants and did this just as the Lord told him to do, but because he was afraid. <laughs> He's afraid. Who's he afraid of? Uh, he's afraid of his dad. He's afraid of the whole town. He's afraid of his family. Uh, that he's taking a stand for the Lord, the true and living God. Uh, what will they think? And so he did it, but it says he did it at night. I'm just going to do it, but I'm not going to let anybody know. <laughs> what are you thinking? In the morning, when they rise, they're going to see it's down. Sure enough, they did. They said, who did this? And a finger was all pointing at Gideon. And they said, let's kill him for doing that. Joash, his dad, steps up and says, whoa, wait a minute. Gideon picked this fight with Baal. Let Baal do his own dirty work. If Baal is a god at all, let Baal deal, deal with him. And because, because of that, that day, nothing happened to Gideon by, from Baal. So that day they called Gideon Jeroboam, saying, let Baal contend with him because he broke down Baal's altar. All of a sudden, he's exalted in the whole community. This guy is a warrior with the gods. And he beats the gods. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not quite the reputation I want if I'm a wimp. <laughs> that I fight the gods and I win. The next thing we find, he's, 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 his wimpiness is exposed by his skirting. He's skirting the issues. Now, all the Midianites, I got Midian on the, on the map up there, all the Midianites and the Amalekites, I got them on the map there where they would be located at, along with all the Eastern people. So I don't have them on there because I don't know who they are or where they're from, but they join forces, it says, all along with these others, and they make their way, they cross over the Jordan River, and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. Now, that is not an arrow. That, that is the shape of the valley area of Jezreel, okay? And so that's where they're camping. They're camping in Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. Oh, I love that expression. The Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. When God calls you to do something, he equips you to do it. He will give you his Spirit to accomplish the task. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he blew the trumpet and summoned the Abazarites to follow him. 32,000 men show up. Ooh, he's got to feel pretty good about that. Except earlier in the passage, it says the Midianites were innumerable. And then later in the passage, it's going to say their army is 135,000 people. Gideon says, <clears throat> so when we, he, he summoned them, then Gideon responds, oh my goodness, I got this army. I'm the leader now he's, he's got these doubts. He's doubting the word of God. He says, if you will save by my hands. What? God has already told him he was going to. As you have promised. He knows what the Lord has promised. Gideon at this point is not trying to determine the will of the Lord. He's trying to get out of the will of the Lord. You ever notice? God wants you to share your faith with someone. First thing you're trying to think of is all the excuses why not. 
Why not? He says, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor, and if there's dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know, oh, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand. Now the creature is dictating to the creator how things have got to be done. Listen, if you're really going to do what you said, yeah, God does what he says. He's testing the Lord, and he knows it. He's tempting the Lord God, and he knows it. And that is exactly what happened that night. He went and he squeezed out of that a whole bowl of water, and there was no dew anywhere else on the ground. Oh, you think he got it, but no. no. Oh, Gideon cries out, don't be angry with me. Let me make just more, one more request. Let me one more, allow me one more test. God, I got to test you one more time. Wait a minute, this is backwards. The only place in the Bible I know where God says you are to test me is when you give your offering. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. He said, test me in your tithes and your offering. Test me, give a tenth, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that you cannot contain it. You'll have more than enough. More than enough. Everywhere else in the Bible, you are not to tempt or test the Lord your God. You're to obey him. He said, let me one more time test you with this fleece. This time, make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. Okay, so that's exactly what the Lord did that night. Afterward, Moses, I mean, <clears throat> Gideon gets up. He goes and gets that fleece. He can't get a single drop out of it. He's skirting what God wants him to do. That's what we do. We do. We do the same thing. Now, his wimpiness is overcome. It's overcome by his downsizing. Downsizing. The Lord said to Gideon, uh, you have too many men. You have too many men for me to deliver the Midianites into, out of your, uh, into their, their hands. In order that Israel may not boast against uh, me uh, that her own strength has saved her. He said, you've got too many men. So he said, anyone who is afraid, anyone who's a wimp, he trembles and he's fearful. Tell him to leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left and 10,000 remain. So 22,000 left. He's left with 10,000 men. But the Lord said, oh, you still have too many. Too many. Too many men. Separate those who lap water with their tongue like a dog from those who kneel down. Now, the person that laps would just kind of step down, lap, all right? The other guy, man, he just jumps out his knees, puts his whole head right in, and he gets a drink. <laughs> and so it says, 300 men lapped. With 300 men that lapped, he said, I will save you. Let the others, the others go. Well, let the others go. So 9,700 left, and Gideon is left with 300 men, and God's got now 300 men. He says, now I got the right amount. I want to tell you something. Bigness does not equal success. Often a person will say, well, how large is your church? I want to say, large enough. Because it's not about bigness. It's not about bigness. Later, Jonathan will say to his armor bearer, because there's only two of them against like 30 guys, he said, the Lord's able to save by many or by, far, by few. It's not about how many. He's got them down to 300. Oh, if you go to chapter 8, you'll find out there's actually 135,000 trained warriors among the innumerable company of people there, 135 trained warriors, and God says, oh, now you got the right amount. You got 300. How do you like those odds? Uh, nobody wants to take those odds. Why did he do this? Why does God pare them down? Here's why. In order that Israel may not boast against me, the Lord, that her own strength has saved her. God wants you to know when you believe and you trust this book, his word, it's not about quantity. It's all about quality. I am with you. I will do what I say. But you have to believe it and don't doubt it.
don't doubt it. Gideon is such a wimp. Next, he's got to go by spying. He says, the Lord says, now, now if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp and listen to what they're saying. So he does. He runs down to the camp. He takes his uh, servant with him. And Gideon arrives just as the men, they're, they're, they're spying. They're listening in on a dream. The guy said, I had this dream. I had this dream that a big loaf of bread, barley bread, came tumbling into town. This would be a sci-fi movie. I mean, just see it. This big, huge, gigantic loaf of bread the size of this church comes tumbling, strolling into, to, into their camp and is rolling over all of their tents, throwing them over. And, and he's telling them, I had, this, I had this dream, this nightmare, the one soldier says to the other, and the other guy says, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon. God has given the Midianites into the whole camp, into his hand. Gideon hears. You think, I'm afraid? God has put fear in their hearts too. Their hearts too. Gideon goes back and he's strong and now Gideon has, uh, he's going to overcome it with leadership. He begins leading. He says, watch me, he tells the men. Watch me. Then he says, well, listen, follow me. That's what a leader does. You know, if you're the leader and you look around and there's nobody back there, you're not leading. <laughs> the leader is leading. He says, watch me, follow me. He says, do exactly as I do. And when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then form all around the camp, blow your trumpets and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So he splits his group into three units of 100 men each, and they're all around the camp. And he tells them, hey, this is what you do. You got to take a pitcher in one hand. You take a trumpet in the other hand. You put, some, you put a torch inside the pitcher. When you get to the place where we're going to do the attack, you watch me. You follow me. You do what I do. Do exactly what I do. And so the 300 company did exactly what he did. When, when Gideon blew the trumpet, they blew the trumpet. When, they, when he threw down the pot to smash it, they threw down the pot to smash it. When he lifted up the torch, they lifted up. So here's the scene. They're all inside the camp sleeping. It's in the third watch. It's dark out. Gideon's men are all around. Gideon takes the lead. He throws down the pot. Big thundering noise wakes everybody up. They come out. They hear it from all the way around the camp because all 300 scattered around got it. He blows the trumpet. He lifts the torch. They shout for the sword of the Lord and for Gideon. Every man jumps out of his tent. Now, you've got to realize, they're Amalekites, Midianites, Eastern people. They all speak different languages. They get out. They hear this guy speaking the other language. Pull out a sword. They start fighting each other. Boom, boom. They got this big battle going on where they're all fighting each other. And Gideon and his army are just standing around watching. They're just standing around watching. Look at this slugfest going on. You say, that was kind of a freaky, coincidental thing. No, no, no. If you go a little bit further in the Bible, it'll happen again. No, it never happened. Yeah, well, it happens again. You're wrong if you think it'll never happen again. Listen, Saul and his army assembled, went against the Philistines, and in total confusion, all the Philistines were out slaughtering each other with the sword. Happened again. In Second Chronicle, listen, the King Jehoshaphat, another time, the battle's not yours, God says. The men of Ammonite, Ammon and Moab, they rose up against the Mount Seir, and after they had finished slaughtering Mount Seir, they turned around and slaughtered one another. It happened again. Listen to me. It's going to happen still again. In the Bible, Ezekiel chapters 37, 38, talk about a battle of Gog and Magog in the end times. And one of the lines in it says, I will summon the sword of Gog on all the mountains, declares the sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. They're going to slaughter each other so that Israel doesn't even have to fight them. It happens over and over and over and over again. What I'm trying to say is these things that are in the Bible happen over and over and over again. And when, when this wimp said, oh, where's all the mighty deeds of God? Poof, there was a flame of fire. And when you say, where is God? He's very much closer than you think. He's very much closer than you think. It's thwarted. Coming down to the end of this. It's thwarted by the presence of the Lord. That's how it was thwarted. The only way he could get rid of his wimpiness was really relying on the fact that the Lord is with you. Whenever you're feeling wimpy, you just got to tell yourself, the Lord is with me, so I'm in the majority. The Lord is with me, so I'm the winner. This, this is my victory. Also by the Lord's calling, God calls you a mighty man of valor, a mighty warrior. A mighty or a virtuous woman, a, a mighty warrior. 
When the Lord calls you, he will equip you to do what he wants you to do. It's also wimpiness is thwarted by the Lord's strategy. You cannot rest on your own understanding. We memorized that verse long ago in this, this year. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. You've got to, you've got to get rid of what is hindering you and get down to the point where, oh, I am just trusting in the word of the Lord alone. The word of the Lord alone. It's better, it's as better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. The Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw their swords and bend their bows to bring down the poor and the needy, to slay those whose ways are upright, but their swords will pierce their own hearts. That's what happened. Gideon went, and his enemies... Swords pierce themselves. You thwart. You thwart wimpiness by the Lord's victory. 300 versus 135,000, impossible. Unthinkable. No military strategist would tell you to do that. When the 300 Spartans faced the Persians, they were in defensive mode and they lost. When 300 Jewish boys faced 135,000, they attacked and they won. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into your hand. The Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other. Here's what's going on. If we're going to get unstuck, we have to accept who we are in Christ. I am a soldier of the cross. I have to endure hardness. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I'm going to have to accept what I have in Christ. I have spiritual weapons. The weapons we have are not of this world. I have the belt of truth. I have the breastplate of righteousness. I've got shoes of the gospel. I've got a shield of faith. I've got the helmet of salvation. I, I have the sword of the spirit, and I have a secret weapon called prayer. Called prayer. If I want to stop being wimpy, I've got to get on my knees and start praying. I've got to take on the armor, and I've got to go into battle. I have to be a mighty man of valor or a woman of virtue. All that person does is they take God at his word, and they do it. They do it. That's what makes you a mighty man of valor. <laughs> there he was, Gideon. <laughs> He's threshing in the wine pit. God says, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Listen to me. If God has chosen you, and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, he chose you to be saved, you know him, you are his chosen soldier, the Lord is with you, and you are a mighty man of valor or a mighty woman of virtue, you are, you are what Gideon was, just a coward who needed the strength of the Lord. That's who we are. That's who we are. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I don't know what battles we all have to face today, but I do know that when you are with us, and we are following your word and doing what you say, hearkening unto your commands, your principles, your precepts, not doubting, but taking your word as it is, that we become mighty men of valor or mighty women of virtue. Make us those kind of people today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.